What's up? What's happening? Welcome here to Lacrosse. Now that is Tom Eschen. As always, I'm Travis Selchurch. Happy to have you alongside us for another show. We're going to recap the Women's World Championship Team USA winners of the gold medal once again. First time ever on home soil. We'll also look ahead to some PLL stuff. We're going to have a little fun with the All-Star Game roster. Yeah, we'll talk to Sam Puzo today. And I think that'll be really cool to hear from her, her perspective yep. on being on the inside of everything from day one until uh, the celebration continuing, of course, and will continue as these weeks and whatever goes on. It's pretty neat to talk to her and get that insight into how it, what it was like being a part of Team USA during this process. And we will also talk to Justin Turry, the new head coach at St. John's, get his perspective mm -hmm. why St. John's was the right move for him. Yeah. Yeah. And what it's like to for him to go home to New York and now uh, have a chance to yeah, coach really there. Intriguing Big East with some new coaches in there and maybe some teams getting ready to build and make that next step. Yeah, between Providence and Marquette, who has had a new coach uh, here rel relatively recently, and Andrew Stimmel, and, and now St. John's. Very different looking conference in terms of head coach. Yeah, yeah. Bobby so, Benson over Providence from Maryland and now Bernhardt's galore in Maryland. It's true. We got all sorts of changes. Yep. Uh, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, oh, yeah, we're done with that. We're going to start yeah. with the Women's <laughs> World Championships. Yes, yes, we should. The uh, World Lacrosse Women's World Championships went as expected, though I give a lot of credit to, to Canada in the gold medal game for making things interesting against Team USA for a little bit. They battled back. They they gave them everything that they could handle. It was a better game than we saw five years ago in 2017. But as many expected, Team USA winners. You know, I think they were talking about it on the broadcast of what really separated Team USA. And I, I think it's what it's continue to be and that's the depth of the talent and uh, you know we're right now watching the sixes discipline take place in the world games and that's where I think a lot of people say that some of that will be evened out but in this format in this world championship you can really see that team USA between the players on the team the players that got most of the time some of the ones that didn't get as much time you're like how did she not play more or how did they not get more credit I mean Ali Mastriani I thought had an incredible tournament and nobody really said a whole lot about her because there's so many other things to talk about she was so good all tournament long and there's even players that weren't on this team that probably could have been maybe for other, whatever it could be so to me just seeing that depth of talent that team usa still continues to employ i think really impressed me through and through throughout the tournament and i think that's really what sticks out you know moving forward here too well let's start with this let's start with what our lasting um impressions and image of the world oh, championships okay. are I would because I think that's probably a better way to start than what I want to get to here in a second what's yours my lasting moment um, I guess would be when Taylor Cummings made the Sports Center top 10 because I think that that moment where she did the like the backhand shovel yeah it gave I think everybody a glimpse into a lot of the, like, the camaraderie and the fun that this team had because we talked about it at the time. You don't see Taylor Cummings doing that a whole lot. She does everything right on the field, and she does it at such a high level, and she doesn't really feel the need to do a lot of that because she's doing everything technically correct, fundamentally. That's the way she's been. That's Marilyn Lacrosse. We understand that. It's so successful. Yeah. But when she started to have some fun, it was like, okay, so that took me beyond what maybe what you saw on the field. That's you know maybe trying things out in practice. That's the fun they're having, not just seeing them celebrate goals. I thought for me that was a moment that said, oh, this team's a, a different. Well, of course, they've won it, but that's what's making this team a little bit more unique, that even some of the players that have that, you know, a different, I guess, mentality than the others, it sort of all is coming together and they're having fun together. You know, you know what I mean? That, yeah. that sort of to took me to the next level and said, okay, that's where they're talking about with this chemistry. She's able to open up and feel comfortable to do that alongside her teammates. Does Taylor Cummings do that if she's not part of a group like this? Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I exactly, wonder. Exactly, right. You know, with, with this kind of team that when they started to get going, you could see some of that starting to percolate a little bit. You see, you know, Kayla Trainer going for some. And, and, you know, Kylie O'Miller, of course, are, are always involved. Marie McCool, who, you know, she missed like three shots the entire tournament while she making was some of those plays. So you're right. I don't know if it's a different group. I mean, if you know, Taylor Cummings, I don't remember her ever doing anything like that in Maryland, you know, so that, and no. that's obviously a very similar minded team with one coach, Kathy Reese. But with this group and these minds around her, it's got, kind of helped her and everybody else open up and find that role which was so important well and I do feel like that was part of the difference of this team than five years ago was a little bit of the flair like you saw it five years ago they had highlights Kayla Trainer was part of that team like they had players that could do a lot of things but 
it was a team that felt like it was more old school, like Taylor Cummings centric in terms of like fundamentally sound, going to win the, the ball in the middle of the field and get the job done compared to what this was, which felt like at times it was almost like a Harlem Globetrotters type feel. Like yeah. they were just throwing stuff to see if they could throw it. Yeah. Because like they're, it's almost like this team wanted to push the envelope a little bit more. And, and that was kind of the feel I got the whole tournament. And they wanted to put on a show. We know that. And that was the big part of the, you know, for the audience, not only in the stands, but at home and for everybody watching to see lacrosse take this stage. But also, I do think Charlotte North plays a factor in all of that, you know, because I think that she has elevated everybody else's game to that highlight potential that we've seen her, you know, create and that everybody sees her and they're like, well, I can do that. I can do something like that, too. I think that her her ability to do so has brought out some of the best in a little bit of everybody in that way, shape and form as well. And that's what my lasting impression and lasting image of this World Championships is, which is Charlotte North's goals and the way in which she shines so bright on the brightest stage with the best talent in the world. Hmm. Like, it's one thing to see Charlotte North do it in college, and we saw that over the, especially the last two years, and how impressive she was winning back-to-back -to -back to World Awards, getting Boston College to the Final Four. But that is just a group of a generation. You know, where you're, okay, you expect players every three, four years that come along that are like Charlotte North. Because we've seen it with whether it was Kylie O'Miller or Kayla Trainer or Taylor Cummins. We saw players who became the best in their little generation. Charlotte North is shining as bright as she is on a world stage in the midst of all those players. Like, you're looking at players that have been the college stars for the last seven, eight, nine years that are part of this team. And Charlotte North is stealing the show because of the way in which she plays the game. I'm not saying that she is far and away better than all the other players, but she does things that are just different than anybody else in the field. We don't see anybody else do it the way Charlotte North does. I mean, you even compare, I was looking at a couple of the free position shots, and it was, I forget which game it was, but Marie McCool and Charlotte North had free positions from almost the identical spot. And they both just wound up and ripped it from the 11 meter mark. Charlotte North shot, and both of them scored. Charlotte North shot looks different. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's just it. Like these hashtag built different, the old thing. She, her shot is built different than everybody else I think we've ever seen play the women's game. And it is a trailblaze. It feels like this is a trailblazing moment of not only what Charlotte North will continue to do in this sport, but the way in which she's changing the game. Because you see all the, the little girls in the stands? You don't think every single one of them is going home trying to do that? Like, I think about, like, Michael Jordan, the shot I, in, back in 98 in the finals where he did the three dribble and the crossover and step back. Everybody in every basketball camp in the country that summer was trying to do that shot. That's what I look at with the lacrosse and Charlotte North in, in the way in which she shoots the ball. Every girl who watched her play goes into the backyard and trying to do that. And I don't know how many other players have done that over the last handful of generations. The only thing I would argue is it adds to what those young players see because Kylie coming up yeah. through all the young players throwing the BTB. So yeah. they're already, I think it's you know, the kids are doing BTBs and now they're adding the Charlotte North, you know, those free position it shots. Does add so you, to know, it. you know what I mean? It's another sort of highlight. It's another person they can go, oh, I'm going to try that now. In addition to, you know, I want to win every ball in the middle like Taylor Cummings. I want to go take the draw. I see Taylor Cummings taking draws. I want to go do that. I want to see the feel like Kayla Trainer. So I think each one of these players sort of has that niche yeah. that you can go out because like I think about growing up and playing basketball it's like I'm gonna do a, a crossover like MJ and go and dunk at my little hoop you know at home or I'll do like Dirk Nowitzki I'll do a fadeaway with yeah. the, the leg you know what I mean it's kind of those little things that all these kids can now look up and there's a lot of different ways and Charlotte North adds to that the thing that I think that I to me just stands out is the the difference like because like before Kylie we saw Kayla do some of the same stuff mm -hmm. before Kayla there were players that were throwing BTBs yeah. before yeah it's just that I, I don't, we just and a lot of it has to do with the technology and how Charlotte has embraced the new stringing technology in order to do this but I do think that is part all part of the picture in changing the game well, I think technology, not only the, what they're using, but also on the Internet. <laughs> you know, you yeah. see these highlights over and over well, again yeah, in this too. generation. That's but where I, they, they consume a lot of this stuff, too. But some of the older sticks that are strung differently, you no, can't yeah. shoot the no, way Charlotte North. No. Like, some of the you, changes in technology and specifications for the stringing has 
led to where Charlotte North is being able to do the things she's doing. And her ability to do that and find and fit into a role in such a short amount of time really blows my mind, too, because this process, we talked about how long of a process it was due to COVID. She was barely on the radar she, when she, it started. She really, I mean, I think she would might have been just finishing up at Duke at that yeah. point, getting ready to go over to Boston College. And she probably didn't have a whole lot of time, maybe a few practices, if you will, with, with these teams. She probably, I think, had one fall classic, right, where they were actually playing competitive games against other countries, other teams. Yeah. You know, I think she had one of those opportunities and fit right in. And she, she said, I think, in the postgame interview, she goes, from day one, this team's been really close. I'm like, well, they, you were in the, kind of in the middle of, of this, this yeah. whole process. But that just shows you how well she integrated into it and, and that that ha that she had the respect of everybody around her where they're like we're gonna let charlotte do her thing we'll let her fit in here amidst to what we're already doing which i think says a lot about her and the teammates around her too yeah absolutely i mean the fact that she was able to steal a little bit of the spotlight after it's kind of carried over from the college season i yep. i did not expect it I, I i really didn't i was i was a little surprised to see her like Right off the jump, she scores the first goal of the tournament for yeah, Team USA. She did it like, like three games in a row. She yeah. it like <laughs> just didn't miss a beat. She's no. like, oh, hey, yeah. I'm still here. Yeah, and, and I think that, like you said, as you look into the future, she's going to be around and, and one of those athletes that I think a lot of people will start to get to know in, in the world of sports, hopefully beyond all that. Speaking of the future, leads me to my next kind of takeaway here from these world championships. And I said it off the top. I really do think that Canada and England – have started to close the gap a little bit with Team USA. And it says a lot less about Team USA because they were as good as, I think, all the teams we've seen here in the past with Team USA that have won gold. I think it says more about the talent we're seeing from Canada and then England as well because England is taking large steps forward in terms of the talent and their dedication to the sport. You've seen it with their kind of embrace, them embracing the Sixes format as well. I, I really do think that they are starting to elevate their game to where I don't know if they're winning. And I, that's the next step. You've got to win against Team USA. But Canada in both games against the United States, especially that first one, they were one play away from making that thing really, really interesting. And I think that's a step forward uh, for both of these programs on the world stage. I think in this instance, in, in this cycle, that, that yes, I, I think that – once, if you look ahead now, I don't know how I don't know how hard and easy that's going to be to sustain this amount of competitiveness because you lose, you know, even go to Australia, who we know won on U.S. soil, yeah. but, you know, two times prior. I mean, you lose somebody who had been around this pro that program, Hannah Nielsen, for a while. You lose Dana Dobie if you're Canada. It's really hard to replace those fixtures quickly you know and, and four years will we'll come pretty quickly and yes yeah, so we're accordingly i'm sure we'll be back in four years but who else there are others and we there are others maddie baxter was really good for canada brooklyn walker welsh defensively was excellent so there is you you're there. talking yourself into no this. i'm 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 letting you know <laughs> that i understand that they do have a lot of youth and talent around but i think that there's so many stars on Team USA. You need yeah. a couple to go at them, you know? And no, you're right. And I think that it's going to take a while to be able to establish the depth where you have multiple to be able to get that win, right? I think that if, in order to get over that top, instead of just uh, judging things on how close the score is, you yeah. have to actually judge by wins and losses. And I think if you want to get over the top, you need to establish some stars that – are able to do that and make those plays because the U.S. has them coming out in droves. Right. right? No, you're That's right. That's what it is. But Canada still has players that are on their way up. You look at this roster, and this is what I wanted to dive into. You mentioned Aurora accordingly, Brooke and Walker Welch, like both of them young, talented players that I think could be players that step into that Dana Doby type role because doby has been out of four world championships. If she makes another, yeah. at that point, I think she'd be in her 40s. That would be unbelievable, but it's hard to rely on that. But I do think Aurora, accordingly, in this world championship showed that she could be the next leader of this program. So you, you look off of that. Brooklyn Walker Welsh defensively is great. Cameron Halso was unbelievable in goal in this uh, throughout this tournament. And they've got some other options there in goal as well if, they, if need be. And I looked at the roster, and 12 of the 18 players for Canada in this world championships graduated here in 2022 from college or are still going to be in college in the next couple of years. So they do have youth. Now, you're right. The question becomes, do you have a depth of stars that can match up against what the United States is going to roll out? 
But I, I do think it's there, and I think we've, we've saw it uh, from the 2015 U19 team in Canada and the influx of those players to, to college programs across the country. I think the Canadian women's program, because of players like Dana Doby, has taken steps forward. Gary Gate has done a ton for this women's program as well. So I do think they can continue to build on what this is because getting close, losing by two, three goals to Team USA, I think only builds some momentum internally for that program to go, okay, we continue to do what we're doing and develop this talent. There is a day in the not-too-distant future that that turns into a one- or two-goal win instead of a one- or two, three-goal loss. Okay. I, that's fine for you to believe that. I just, I, like you said, I do think it's developing. I think there are there is promise yeah. among the future in, in those programs. The only other thing is, as everybody else gets stronger, so does the U.S. You yeah, know, but, I think at the same time, the they, they not... have players. Izzy Skane wasn't there, and, uh, you know, Jamie Ortega wasn't. Like, there's players that yeah. Chaitlin Wurzberger, who was on the U19 team playing with the Sixes now, Madison Doucette, the same deal. Like, there's a lot of names that weren't there that probably will be, and maybe yeah, those, those players right. would easily be on some of these teams right now. Yeah. So I just to me, I feel like the depth just goes so deep and it just gets deeper for Team USA as lacrosse continues to grow, not only around the world, but in so America. So are you saying it's worthless? Canada should stop and go home? No, they don't I'm not have saying any chance? That at, I'm not saying just, that at all. I'm like, just saying that Team USA will continue to grow yeah, exponentially as all these other countries continue to grow as well. And their I depth just, is so deep that it's really difficult for any, anybody else to catch up. But you can't give it's hard, up. It's hard like, to catch I, up. But, but you have to look at the progress. There has been legitimate progress over the last five years for Canada. They didn't since, get since they, 27. They, they, they didn't get blown out by Team USA in the opener. Like they, they did not. Five years they, ago. they did five years ago, and then like, they came back and played well in the gold, better in the gold medal game five years ago. That's yeah, correct. But like yeah. that, that game, like that first game in the tournament here, Team USA ran away with it a little bit more in the fourth quarter. But there was one save that. It would have been a tie game. With it was a woman up situation for Canada in the early in the fourth quarter. Canada scores. They're tied. The game's tied, and that's a whole different ball game. Kaylee Waters made a great save on, yeah. a, on a point blank shot. That that wasn't happening five years ago. No. I, well, I th I think for this tournament, yes, I think that Canada closed the gap right now. Yeah. I and would so, just be wondering what it's going to look like four years from now. I think this yeah, Canada team with Dana Doby as their leader or Laura Cordingly coming in, yes, I do think in this instance they close the gap, but I don't know if the gap will get smaller or bigger by the time the next championship comes through, knowing what each country loses and gains over the next four years. But I would argue it's a momentum boost that is more important. Like, Team USA winning gold on home soil doesn't mean nearly the same as Canada feeling like they have a chance against Team USA moving forward in terms of momentum-wise. If you're Like, the sport isn't changing in the United States because Team USA won gold the way in which they did it. No. It can change if Canada feels like, hey, we legitimately are that close. Like, we've, saw it, we've seen it in the men's game. Canada winning world championships against Team USA changes the way people and kids think about that level of the sport than if you're losing every single time out. Yeah, no, uh, you're, you're not wrong about so that. I, I, really, I just wonder who is the next generational talent that they oh, will have. Oh, we don't have know. They could have that, somebody that's that, in high school well, right you, now you, that could you play need for that, that team. That's what you, no, you, you I agree know. that you need that because you're losing that. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're losing that. And, and Dana Doby, and, and if you're looking at England, Megan Whittle, don't know if she's going to be around the next time around. Like, I'm not saying she's generational, but a leader for that program for a while. So, But you're you, talking you, about you, players that could be seniors am, in high I'm, school well, or freshmen I am. in That's college. What I'm just projecting and saying they need someone. you can't someone. project that. Like, I know, you, I know what's they what want, they need. I'm, you're also projecting four years from now and saying they're closing the gap and going to win with all this depth. I'm saying if they want to do that, they need a, someone that is almost and could be a generational talent to be able to get over the top. That's yeah. what you, you, you need someone like Dana Doby again to come through. Right. Yeah, I don't but know who that also, could be. But you no also idea. don't like. That's who you need to be able to win that game. No, I right? agree. But, like, four years from now, you don't know who, like, other than maybe Charlotte North and a couple of these other pro players that were part of this team, like, Taylor Cummins probably isn't playing again four years from now. Kayla Trainer's probably not playing again four years from now. Like, so, no, so you're right. just, those just are like generational talents that are moving on. 
Team USA, now, like, look, they've got players that we know of in college lacrosse, but who's to say that those players then become the generational talents you expect them to be from in four years? Because that's the way Team USA has always been. Well, but, that's but always who's, happened. But who's to say that Canada can't do that now not, with what we've seen from some of these I, players? I didn't say they couldn't do it. I never I, said you that. Are, it sounds I like you have zero they, belief. I said if they want to do that, they need. that's what they need to do. That is what their path has to be. You need to have and find that, and then you were able to close the gap even more. Tom's telling Canada to stop trying and playing lacrosse. That's I don't think I saying. ever said that. That's that's kind I, of what I'm. I don't. I at. think that 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 I was just giving everybody a framework to how Canada would be able to do it. Anyway, and I'm, I understand your belief in that because there is a lot of young talent. They just need a generational talent like a Dana Dobie to be able to get themselves over the top. I also think that's you could, the formula. We just know the U.S. is going to do that anyway. They, that's what they've shown. That's, yeah. the hit, that's what history has told me. Not that it's not going to happen. I mean, the U.S. is just awesome. Like, why, why do we have to fault it? U.S. is great, and everybody else but is I trying think, to catch up. Yeah, well, I think they're making waves. Okay. They made waves this time. The five, from five years ago, Canada and England were better. Okay. This, this group was better than they were five yeah, years ago. Yeah, but the... Ah! <laughs> wow. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're mad because I'm, agree I'm agreeing with you. No, but, I'm, but you're, this like, is an you're saying, yeah, like, yes, four years from now is going to be different. But five years ago, it was different. Like, there's... Uh, yes. That, okay. that is all true. I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen, but the momentum is a positive. I'm looking at this as a positive. Uh, okay. And we'll see if, if... And if in four years they continue to close the gap, that will be true. Okay. Right? Yeah. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I'm just. That's kind of what you were saying. You're kind of saying the United States is awesome and there's no chance that Canada is going just to get any I'm saying it's very difficult okay. for the, anybody anyway. else to catch up. Uh, it's speaking, a tough hill to climb. Speaking of great players for Team USA, we had a chance to catch up with Sam Apuzo and we did not disagree with her. We had a lot of fun with Sam Apuzo. So listen to that interview now. Sam Apuzo joins us now. Sam, congratulations first and foremost. Uh, I got to ask, how, how does it feel? What's it like now? You're a couple days removed from this. <laughs> um, it's an amazing feeling. It's still, I wake up and I'm, it feels surreal that it actually happened. Uh, <laughs> but it's just an incredible, it's just like a uh, dream come true um, this past week. What was Saturday like? Um, it was everything you could imagine it's something that uh we've all looked forward to for so long and kind of dreamt of um there's a mix of emotions so so much happiness like sadness that it was over and we we're kind of leaving as a team uh, but just so much excitement and and love for one another with that team you've played in championship games several times in your life um how did the atmosphere of this compare to those that just the feel of it all um yeah it was Obviously similar, but very different. Um, we had an incredible crowd there on Saturday. Um, and just to see so many people supporting the U.S. and supporting our team, uh, it was it was a very surreal thing. Uh, especially other countries were there. There was, there was so much support, not just for the U.S., but for the entire tournament um, the past week. So it was kind of cool to see everything kind of come along on that Saturday. You mentioned the energy of the crowd, and I think that probably played into it. But I felt like for the whole tournament, anytime anybody for Team USA scored, your celebrations were like unlike anything I've seen. Like there was this excitement and this thrill. Like you could just see it. Who who, who kind of established that on the team? Who was the the provider of the energy? Um, I think it comes with all of us. We are so excited and happy for one another. We all like love beautiful lacrosse plays and, and awesome lacrosse moments. And I think every one of those goals this past week um, embody that. And I think we were all just so excited to be playing one another and playing on the stage. And I think it all just came from all of us. Because if you look at everything, everyone's so excited for one another and everyone's so excited for each goal, whether we were up by 20 or, or, or whatnot, that excitement still stayed the same. You know, I was wondering, uh, after seeing the interviews and everything and talking about how you guys came together and, and had that chemistry, which Jenny Levy had talked about, was so important with your group, is there a, is it because of the respect? Because it feels like you hear you, you guys talk about each other with so much love and adoration, not only for the people that you played alongside or those that you watched growing up or as you were coming up through. Is, is it a respect thing? That everybody respects each other so much that kind of brought you together? 
Yeah, I completely think um, respect had a lot to do with it. Um, I think also a lot of us played with each other and against each other, whether it's with AU, the professional league prior, um, or during college. And I think we've seen each other grow as athletes and players um, throughout our years and be able to finally kind of come together as a team with go with COVID happening the past few years. Uh, we haven't really been able to play together. So being able to come together in the short time we actually had to play, um, we had so much respect for each other's game and kind of knew everyone had a skill set and kind of something special about them that we're going to bring to the team. And that's kind of what we leaned on throughout. E you had a chance to play with a, a bunch of players, as you just mentioned, that were on this team, but I felt like there were a couple of connections that were special. And I'll start with the Kayla Trainer one. Obviously, she was a, a coach there at BC when you were a player, and I felt like you had, a, in times, this kind of similar role for this offense and in, in where you were positioned. H how did that dynamic work, and, and what was it like playing with her at this uh, on this stage? Yeah, it was it was incredible. Um, it's always been a dream of mine to be able to compete on the same field as Kayla. Um, in college, we played against one another my freshman year, um, and we actually never even got to play together at AU this past summer. So being finally able to play at the same field with her on the same attack line uh, was a dream come true because she's always someone I've looked up to, and I've learned so much uh, as her my has her being my coach, and then also coaching on the same staff with BC together. Uh, so it was it was really a dream come true because she is such an incredible human being, but also a player and so talented uh, that to be able to share the field with her was something that I've always looked forward to. So I'm going to follow that up with Charlotte North, who it's kind of the opposite for you. You have coached her. What was it like sharing the field with Charlotte? Yeah, I mean, being able to coach Charlotte this past year um, at BC, she is such an electric uh, player, um, such an electric personality, um, and I love her so deeply. She is such a great person, but so great to play with, too. Um, but, yeah, this is the first time I've ever got to play with her, too, since she came to BC after I graduated. Um, and being able to coach her this past year and now finally be able to play with her on the same, on the same line um, like Kayla um, is just a dream country because she also is someone – that has changed the game so much. So being able to play and kind of feel it while we're playing uh, was something special. Is it a, a flip of the switch between Coach Apuzo and teammate Apuzo? Same thing with like Kayla. Are you guys turning into players then as soon as you leave, like she's going recruiting for Syracuse? You know what I mean? It's, it's <laughs> got to be a, a different thing to be able to navigate sort of those different personalities you guys have. Yeah, I, I think it's funny. All of us have such different roles. Um, outside of this team, but that doesn't really affect us on the field at all. Um, Kayla's still coaching me on the field. I'm coaching uh, Charlotte. She's helping us. So it's this mutual respect from one another because we all obviously have so much lacrosse um, background and, and gotten ourselves this far with our career. So we all respect one another's opinions and kind of help and everyone's seeing different things. So I think even though we have different roles, quote unquote, but um, with this team that, that didn't hinder us at all on the offense. I think, and going back to Charlotte, as you hit on it, as she continues to take this game to another level and show people things that they can do, I, I mean, you're, you're surrounded by the most talented players, yourself included, of this last generation, and you're watching her step onto this field for the first time and, and do these things at this level against the best players in the world. What's it like to see that, and, and what is it about her that allows her to, like, no matter what the stage has been, she steps on there and, and she seems to be able to, to perform at the same level? Yeah, Charlotte is truly one of a kind. I think there's no one in the world currently that plays like her or is able to perform like her. Um, and she just has so much heart and so much passion in her play, um, and she's always willing to change change and kind of innovate and every be creative of everything she does uh, she was born for this stage really she she really knows how to put on a show and it's so fun to see her and see how excited she is um, but I, I can see her going a lot further with her U.S. career and kind of keep going, pushing forward and pushing the game um, because now there's so many young fans out there trying to be like Charlotte Marth and she's just elevating the game and kind of giving us um, giving our our, our sport um, 
definitely elevating our sport to the next level, I think. I mean, it had to be pretty cool, though. I mean, you were the MVP of the championship game as well. I mean, you're doing that too, Sam. What's that yeah. like for you to be part of that movement, not in addition to Charlotte and all these other great athletes you surrounded yourself with? Yeah, it's incredible. Um, like I said, this is something that I've always wanted to be part of, the U.S. team, and to be able to have – um, this great role coming in and be able to kind of perform and, and do what my teammates needed of me, um, especially that last game. Uh, it really is something special and something that I'll always hold uh, close to me. And it, it is cool to see the fan base that we had this past weekend and see all the young girls lining up the field after every single game, whether it was rain or shine. And there's a lot of rain, a lot of delays. So <laughs> to see them stay and kind of be there, and still want our autographs at 11:45 at night. Um, it really, it kind of, it puts a lot, um, a lot in your heart of how much we've done for this sport and kind of how much uh, the sports continue to grow and kind of push forward. I mean, that was part of Jenny Levy's goal was that, you know, obviously you guys wanted to win gold, but it was more than just a medal. You wanted to continue to move this sport forward. What do you hope as, as a group that the, the takeaway is and the message is about this team when people look back on it years down the road? Um, I think the biggest thing that we even talked about after the game is, yes, we have so much talent, we have so much skill, but I think the fact that how much we loved one another, this, this whole ride, and how much we actually cared for one another, and it was such a genuine group of girls, um, all the way down to our, our support staff, everyone was so invested and um, so genuine. Um, I think that was the biggest thing. And like you said, is our, our celebrations, our, our excitement for one another kind of shows that and displays that. And I think that was one of the biggest things that I'll take away from this experience. Yeah, that's that's really cool and, and really special. All right. So I got to ask before we go here, your favorite highlight of the tournament. What was the <laughs> coolest thing you saw over the course of the, the couple weeks you guys played? Um. You don't All have to say that so Dana Dobie's goal was really cool, but I know she wasn't yeah. Team USA. <laughs> you can you can use that separately. You can you can say a Team USA player. We know that that was really a great goal too. <laughs> yeah, that was incredible. Honestly, like to, for Dana, she's I am in awe of her this past week. She was amazing um, in every game. Um, I don't know if a specific play comes to mind, but I think throughout this entire experience, my goal was kind of take, make sure that I was kind of taking snapshots and trying to keep making sure I, I remember things and really kind of seeing things that um, stuck home to me. And I think one of the biggest things that I think I'll never forget is during the um, ceremony, the award ceremony, we were singing the national anthem. And I think I looked around to my teammates and that was the most special moment that I've ever been a part of, being able to sing our anthem um with my teammates with their arms around each other with a gold net, uh gold medal around our necks i think that was the coolest thing i've ever i've ever experienced with my lacrosse career yeah that's really really cool how do you celebrate a world championship <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun a lot of singing a lot of dancing <laughs> um a lot of hugs and cry uh crying that definitely is how we how we did it and any cool <laughs> moments off the field with some of these other countries interactions you, you had with anybody else over the course of a couple of weeks yeah, I think um, the opening ceremony was really cool to be a part of, just seeing every team out there to see how much um, the World Championship grew from 2017 to 2022, the amount of teams that were added and kind of being able to um, interact with everyone in that moment, but also in the dining halls and in, in the dorms was really cool. Yeah, it was, uh, well, I, I'll say it was really, really cool to watch you guys play and the performance that you guys put on and, and everything was unbelievable. It was a really, really exciting couple of weeks. Congratulations on the gold medal. Thanks so much for the time. And a quick turnaround. You got to get back on lacrosse field for the Athletes Unlimited season coming up in a week. So good luck with that. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate, Appreciate the time. Thank you. Sam Apuzo, awesome. She played incredibly well, especially in the she championship did. game. All, all, all tournament long. She was yeah. so important, I think, for Team USA. So it was great to see her. And she's got a, everyone's got a, who played in the, the championships. Quick turnaround here. They go play in the Athletes Unlimited now. <laughs> yeah, they've like got a week off. Yeah. And then it's 
game time. And it's and another situation where they stay at the same place for about four weeks. She four said. weeks, yeah. yeah. So they got another thing where they're like they're just away from whatever they were doing. She's recruiting in between all these other people and coaches doing the same and living out. I mean, they're playing it's lacrosse, so they're probably loving it. But yeah, for sure. Cool. It, but and, and athletes unlimited. We didn't touch on this. I was going to ask Sam about this too. A, a great and uh, the P, WPLL these women's professional leagues. Of course, keeping a lot of these athletes, you know, in playing shape yeah. and competing also at a high level, which I think contributed to some of the competitiveness we got um, over the course of that tournament, too. And a chance for them really to build on the momentum of what we saw in the Women's World Championships yeah. over the last couple of weeks. Now, not too long after, they'll be jumping right back onto the field. So yeah. I, I think that's important, and, too. And, and, and you, if you, you know, the rules of the international different. game we know are different, but go watch Athletes Unlimited after that. You will have a blast. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, so, fast. Yeah, it's very exciting. So don't, don't worry about any rules. Those rules are, are very More, exciting. They're very right. fun. Yeah, uh, speaking of exciting rules, yes. PLL has a bunch of those. Uh, their all-star well, game the coming all-star up. The all-star game, they're mixing things up. You get your NFT. You could make some of the rules through that, I think. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah, it was so a free thing. Yeah. All-star game this Saturday, Gillette Stadium, Foxborough, Massachusetts. And uh, part of their deal is they're rolling out their, their new Premier Pass. And if you are a, a Premier Pass holder, you can vote on what rules they'll be experimenting with throughout the game. you got all sorts of wacky stuff. But one of the things that we thought might be interesting, especially with the World Games going on with the, the Sixes version of the sport, would be, all right, who would your Sixes team be made up of the PLL All-Stars? Obviously, Trevor Baptiste, Connor Fair picked their, these All-Star teams, but we're going to start from scratch. Okay. All the All-Stars in one big bucket, and Tom, or I, and Tom and I are going to draft our starting Sixes team. So five field players and a goalie yeah. on who we okay. would take. Uh, do you, do you want to go first? Yeah, I didn't bring a pen, so I'm going to have to figure that out as All right. time goes anyway, on. I'll, so I'll try to keep. Why don't you um, go first? And um, Oh, I get to kick this yeah, off. I you, get first pick? I, I lose because I'm going to actually leave the set here mid-show and go get a pen. Travis, you think about your pick. This is, this is television, oh, everybody, so, and radio. And a podcast. So I'm going to go get my pen. I'm going to walk back into the set. Tom's here. back here, Hello, and we're going to do some drafting. Yep. See, um, this is what it's all about. This is this. We're real people. We're, we do real things. All right. All right. So you look at the roster, and there are a handful of guys that are PLL All Stars that are also just. If yeah, you're yeah. listening to this on Tuesday or Wednesday, just finishing up the World Games with either the United States or Canada in the Sixes version of the sport. Tom Schreiber. Uh, Zach Courier playing for Canada, uh, Jeff Teat as well, and then uh, Lyle Thompson was supposed to play for the Iroquois Nationals, but was uh, unable to due to an injury. So you got a couple of guys that are that we're seeing here. I'm going to go with my first pick, just because of what I saw from Canada in sixes yesterday in the semifinals. I'm going with Zach Courier hmm. because I think he might be the perfect sixes player. Yeah, I mean, between what he does defensively as a as a defensive midfielder and then his ability off the ground, he actually leads Canada in, in ground balls. There are a lot less of them in the Sixes version because when the ball hits the, the turf, a lot of times it's going out of bounds. It's right. just a turnover. But he leads the team in ground balls on top of 12 goals, four assists. He's an efficient shooter as well. He's so He's really slippery to, to try to defend. So I love Zach Kerr. He's my, he's my top overall pick. And he, he's explosive around the crease. You know, you mentioned he's slippery. Yeah. He, he will, you know, he'll make the diving goal. He'll do what he has to do. And, of course, he's been great in the PLL this year as well, being an all-star. Six goals, three assists there. 23 ground balls once again, leading a, a category that is beating face-off men, you know, in, in yeah. some aspects, which he does in the NLL too. Well, and that's the other thing too. In a place where, like, you don't have a face-off guy, you can send Zach Kerr out to the X and he can win you some face offs at the beginning of quarters as well. Yeah. So I, I like his versatility um, and you mentioned him around the crease like his his fakes and then crease yeah. dives. Fantastic. Yeah, so I got courier. All right. Um, this is tough. I, I guess I wasn't really expecting you to go courier there. <laughs> Who are you going um, with? I'll take. Um, I, I'm going to have to go with Tom Schreiber. OK, um, you know, I, I obviously he's Captain America. So if I'm starting a team, I'm going to start with leadership. As you know, I'm, you know, the captain will lead the team. And, you know, you look at his NLL experience the now working with the Sixes team. I, you know, I think that 
the Sixes team is a lot of different players than you might normally see for Team USA. I think it says a lot about how much he might enjoy this format if he's going and playing in this tournament. I know this is a big deal, the World Games, but you're not seeing the main guys that we might see in Team USA, I, I don't know, in the next World Championship. Yeah. So I think that for him to be competing in this and doing it at a high level, I think talks about his commitment to it, and that's really impressive. So I'm going to go with Schreiber. I think that he does so many good things that he's an invaluable part of any team, whether that's field, box, sixes. So I'm going to start my team with him. You know, it's interesting with Schreiber. He's got seven goals throughout these uh, these world games, three assists for, for ten points over the course of four games. Interesting thing, he was talking with Terry Foy from inside the cross after one of the games, and they were talking about the difference between their first half and the second half. And a lot of it, a lot of it was just shooting efficiency. Yeah. Like, your ability to shoot efficiently in sixes because the fact if you miss the cage and you don't hit anybody on the opposing team, it goes out of bounds. Yeah. It's the other team's ball. It's right. a turnover, just like basketball. So I, the lack of, like, a quote-unquote rebound on a missed shot I think is really important and I think his experience in the NLL shooting in tight places and making sure it's on frame I think it, is important. Yeah, right. He's a good shooter yeah. you know and there are you can't that's why you can't just you know whitewash the entire NLL and say he's going to be a great sixes player because yeah. there are volume shooters in the NLL where just like they'll, they'll yeah. put up 15 shots and score three goals in the sixes game that doesn't really work there's 12 those are 12 turnovers right Right at the end of the day. So I think Schreiber and his efficiency also. Like you said, that's a good point. Um, so I, that's Schreiber is what I'm starting my team. Are we snake drafting this or we just, you just get to the first I feel pick like two, you can't really snake draft, okay. with, draft with two right. people. You go again then, yep. You gave me the first pick. No, I was willing I to get, my, I, I know, exactly. Pick, so I appreciate that. That was our um, that was the deciding factor. I'm going to go with a guy <laughs> who... Scientific. <laughs> I'm going to go with a guy who might be the MVP of just about every league here in the next couple of years, and that's Jeff mm, T. Yeah, I was going between Schreiber and T for mine. Yeah, I mean, look, I think I got... There are a lot of guys that are actually on these... PLL rosters that I really like as sixes players. But, I mean, we've seen Jeff T do it at every level of the sport. There's no question. And his skill set in all of the levels of the sport is exactly what I think makes him a great sixes player, which is, like, he's not this incredible, crazy great athlete. He doesn't have crazy speed, but he's so quick. And I think with the smaller field and the shorter amount of time, the quickness and that first step, second step, beating a guy – real quick and then making a quick decision I think is so important and his ability to feed around the crease like there are tight windows we saw um, against England in the the semifinals for Canada this of the world games they've dropped into a zone because they're like all right we're going to dare you to shoot from the outside well Canada said screw that we're, we're going to be we're such good passers even in tight areas that we're just going to move you enough so we can find that little sliver of a pass on the backside and somebody's wide open sliding into a zone that's the difference of a great team I think in sixes is being able to if somebody drops behind like down and kind of sinks in you still can pass them out of it without just settling for long shots yeah and Teet's a guy that like we said he we talked about this before could be maybe the best player in the world here soon so you know he wins the rookie of the year in the NLL this year 14 goals five assists in the PLL and it feels like you can put him in any group and he can find a way to be successful, right? Yep. That's what he's done his entire life. He just ha has that knack. He has that feel, and the awareness for him on a lacrosse field is different than everybody else's, which is why I'm going to take my next pick and be Lyle Thompson. Mm, that's so, a good one. You know, because I, I just – I talk about T. I'm like, these are all the things that Lyle Thompson has. So I'm going to go <laughs> yes, with him. I, I was a good even, pick. I didn't, I didn't know if I was going to pick him or not, but I'm like, I'm talking myself into Lyle right now. Yep. So Lyle, unfortunately, didn't see him during this World Game Sixes tournament, but I, I just – you can't – to me, if you want to build a team and you want to have this be the format for that, like his knowledge of the game and, you know, of, of course, what he brings to the table and to a culture of it, the game is so important. And I think that he would be a great person just to be a teammate with. And at the end of the day, you want great teammates in a, in a format to me that's really interesting when it comes to who you're playing with, because I feel like there's more – it's a little bit more individual, and you have to really trust each other what, because it moves so quickly. Like you said, the shooting, the premium on that is so important. So you need people you can trust. And Lyle, yeah, he'll put some shots up, but at the end of the day, he's going to make the right decision. Well, you know the thing about both Lyle and Teeth, their experience playing tons of box, not only professionally but throughout their younger careers, I think is important for when you get stuck defensively. Because, yeah. like, you're right. going to be on defense. So, yeah. Like, it happens in the NLL. It's going to happen in sixes. Like, can you stay in front of your guy and do you have a concept of how to defend? Because, like, like, it's one thing to be a guy who can really ride 
hard as an attackman. It's another thing to get caught stuck back defensively and actually stay with a guy for 20 yeah. to 30 seconds. I, I trust those guys if they get st they, when they get stuck back there, be able to make some plays. Yep. All right. Um, all right. Next. I'm Round gonna, three. I'm going to go with something maybe uh, a little different here because of, I think, the premium on the spot. And I'm going to go with Blaze Reardon as my goalie. Because you look at all these goalies, and no offense, all of them are good. There's reason they're PLL All-Stars. But Blaze Reardon has the ability to play the field. And in a sixes roster, first of all, you've got to have a, a goalie that you're probably only going to have one goalie, period. Because having a backup guy is just a waste of, of roster spot if you're going for their full 12 that you're allowed to have. And secondly, the, the goalie starts everything. So having a guy who can hit somebody on an outlet and has some athleticism to get outside the crease, maybe move up the field a little bit, like it just adds a whole new dynamic to it. So I think Blaze Reardon, because of that, is maybe the most important pick I have. So I'm going to go with him in wow. the third round. Interesting you go with Blaze there. Of course, had an outstanding PLL season last year and, of course, doesn't play goalie in the box game. Right. And, he's a field player. You know, he's a field player there. And like you said, he can go up and down the field. I guess, I mean, I, it'd be really interesting to see him in the Sixes format. I, I would be curious to see how that would work because he's not, he doesn't play in that aspect as a goalie in the box game, right? Because that's the, that's the only wonderment I would have about yeah, but him in this format too. I do, the, the goal, I mean, we've seen Jack Kelly play really well in goal for Team USA during yep. the World Games. I, I do think it's far more of a field goalie feel to it in Sixes than it is I mean, I guess Dylan Ward's probably, like, the perfect guy. Like, if Dylan Ward was on this list, he would be maybe the perfect guy because yeah. he plays goalie in both. Right. But I really do think it's more of reliant on your field goalie skills than it is your box goalie okay. skills. Box goalies, with all the pads and everything, is just completely yeah, different. Yeah, you're kind of just, <laughs> just kind of moving around. And not it's that like, they're not good. Not that they don't make a lot of great plays. No, but they're, like, very subtle movements yes. compared to what you're trying to yeah, do in the field. active. So I can yeah. wait now on my goalie. So you, you can, yeah. I'm not, get one goalie I'm not pick. taking I'm another one. That's my last round pick now. I'm good. Yeah. Um, I'll go defense, then I'll go Graham Hasek. Uh, um, multiple NLL Defensive Player of the Year. He's an all-star with the Archers, plays for Halifax. And you're looking for a guy that has all the defensive characteristics uh, you know, of a great pole, which he is in the PLL, but can do it with a short stick. Yeah. And that's what Hasek does. We see him do that in the NLL all the time. That, that, that skill set, to me, probably the most translatable between box, the NLL, what they do in sixes. So i got to go Hasek there as, as my main defense guy. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, Lyle Thompson told a uh, said it to me when we were talking a couple of years ago. I asked him, who's the toughest player for you to go up against? And he said, Graham Hasek and mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. He's like, I just don't like playing against Graham Hasek, <laughs> whether it's in the field, it's box or whatever. So I would I would assume that that would translate onto the sixes field as well. Yes, yes. I yeah, think we'll go with Hasek for he, that. Uh, he, he will make you pay. Um, all right. I am going to go with another versatile guy here. And I'm going to go with Danny Logan. Uh, from, oh. the, from the Atlas. Okay. He plays short stick D midi in the, in the field game. But I just, I, I like his versatility because I think you need a guy who can defend. And Danny Logan has certainly showcased that. He's been great on the face-off wings throughout his time playing in the field, whether it was at Denver or now in the, in the pros. And he can score. Like, we've seen it here in the PLO. He's got some offensive prowess as well. So he's got, he kind of checks all those boxes. I like him as a guy who will be able to just not leave the field. He also feels like a guy who just has energy for days. So yeah. I'm going Danny Logan. Uh, I mean, you watch some of these games in sixes. Like, the first quarter of the United States and Japan yesterday in the, the semifinals was nonstop. There These was guys were sprinting yeah. back and forth. It was. It felt like they were running more than you would on a basketball court. That so you got to have guys who are going to go nonstop. Yeah. And so I, I think Danny Logan's that kind of uh, guy. Okay, I'll continue the run on short stick D middies. So I'll go with Tarafenko. Uh, you know, that was my he, other. You know, I was he, torn between the two of them. You know, he has such like you said. He's one of those hard nosed nonstop kind of players who does everything, and that's what you need in this format. You need a guy that's going to be able to do that, and then can go down on the other end and maybe score a couple goals for you too and I think Logan might be a little bit better than that than Tarafenko but I think in this aspect I think that Tarafenko in this format as well I mean I, I don't think you can go wrong you know in getting a guy like that I think the other I think Goodrich is playing if he was on this list I probably would play him yeah. he's playing for Team USA in yeah, the Super he's... Sixes 
So if he was on this list, I probably would have taken him in that. But uh, Tarafanko, another one of the best guys available um, in terms of that position. It kind of shore up that defense. Um, so that's what mine looks like so far. So I got Shriver, Lyle, Hasek, and Tarafanko. Not, not bad so far. Where are you going pick five? Yeah, so all right. So I've got Courier, Teat, Reardon, and Danny Logan. Hmm, I don't know where to go here. I'm really torn. I've got a couple of different options, and uh, I'm not sure where to go. I'm not sure if I want to go offense or defense here. Hmm, you know what? Let's go defense, because I, I don't. I feel like I don't have a true defensive guy to kind of match yeah. up where you yeah, went. Yeah, you got to make the, This is the team you're rolling out there. Yeah. You know, there's no, this is it. Yeah, so I'm going to go with Mike Manley, another guy who hmm. plays defense in the outdoor game. Saw so it, it played a bunch uh, indoors for the... Uh, for the uh, the Nighthawks there in Rochester as well. So I'll go Chrome, with Chrome, right? Mike Manley, he's a yes. Chrome player. Yeah, yeah, he's he's playing for the Chrome now. I, I mean, I mean, tough nose, big physical presence. I, I, I believe he's also a police officer up there in this, the state of New York. So I'm going to go with Mike Manley. Okay, Mike Manley, I, I like that. That's a pretty interesting pick for you as you go defense. You probably have one more offensive player you probably need. Yes, I do. For your team, yeah. You, you I mean, Courier's good, but you, you, right now you I have T. Your, your offense is flowing through Teat right now. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah, I mean, that's, which is Courier. fine. I like both yeah. of those okay. guys. All right, it's going good. All right, so I'm at pick five here. I'm in between a couple. Um, it's a lot of places you can go. There's a lot of different options I could go here, and you know, I'm going to go with Justin Anderson from the crew. Huh. I like. Okay. I like his progression from North Carolina to Chrome. He's played, obviously, he's an all star. Really good athlete. And a really good athlete. He was actually a part of the Super Sixes event they had in England um, last year. Or was that? In, no, that was in the United States. Yeah, yeah that was, was a, a I'm thinking of the, I'm US the fly. I'm thinking the fly. Yeah. Team, the other Sixes thing they did yeah. over the, overseas. But he was a part of the Super Sixes event. So this is a format that he appreciates. He's been a part of at the same time. Eight goals to assist with Chrome this year. So Anderson can be another one of those guys as a midfielder and the PLL can go two ways for me and, and score. And I, I think that that's, I'm kind of rounding out a team that's going to play up and down and score quite a bit. I think he can complement guys like Schreiber and Lyle pretty well in that offense. Lyle can carry it, and Anderson and Schreiber kind of have that two-headed approach from either side up top. All right, so I come down to my final pick. Um, so I need somebody offensively to go with Courier and Teat. I mean, I, Logan, I, I feel good about Logan running on that offense as well. You know, I um I, I didn't I had it this guy marked down originally and I wasn't sure if I was gonna go with them. I'm, I'm between a couple of guys at like the attack position, but because of what we were talking about with shooting and the efficiency you need and be able to pick your spots, and I think Courier and Teat are guys that I feel confident working inside. I want somebody who can stretch the, the field a bit more and can, can zone buster type guy. I'm going to go with Logan Wisnowskis. Wow. We saw him, I mean, his shooting ability at Maryland, and a lot of it's credit to the, the shots we got from some of their low-angle cameras, but, yeah. like, his ability to pick corners this year was really impressive. He was a high-percentage shooter, and it was one of the th – I mean, he, that was – like, if there was a skill that stood out why he won the Tawarton Award and was named the best player in college lacrosse this year, it was his shooting ability. He was unbelievable – and in terms of step down shots this season, I also like his size in terms of being able to match up at the other end if he gets stuck uh, playing some defense. So I'm going to go with Wisnowskis in the Chrome. You know, I you know I was thinking about Wisnowskis recently and what made him different this year is that he uh, his adaptability. It really like he fits the need of a team, and I think that you're seeing that now in the program, the the pro game too because. Yeah, I mean, he was the leader on Maryland. And, yeah. and now, I mean, Nick Turn is that vocal leader on, on the Chrome, right? They're, they're the, for the Chrome, that right? Uh, yes. Yes, I think. I know they're on the same team. But yeah. They're, yeah, they are. They're, they're Chrome, Chrome guys. Yeah, they're Chrome guys. So they, Nick Turn's kind of that vocal leader. And then you have Wisnowski, who just kind of finds his role and embraces it. He did that with Bernhardt two mm -hmm. years ago. Yep. And then he took the number one, and he became the Tour Time winner. So it, I, I really like that pick for sixes in that you kind of have to figure out your role almost as the game's going on. And it changes because sometimes. It will evolve and ebb and flow depending on how the game's going, what type of game, how the shooting's going. Like, he'll pick his spot, and he'll make sure he's efficient in that, too. I think for him, the efficiency and whatever role he's had in his career has always been really impressive. Yeah, so I, I like that addition. I, I feel like he's a great complement to Courier and yeah. T when we're looking at what we're trying to do offensively. All right, I have two goalies to choose from, right? Yeah, you, gotta, got, you need a goalie. I forgot you need a goalie. Yeah, I have to, I have to pick a goalie here. Um, I'm going to go – I have a choice between Jack Kincannon and Sean Scannone. 
and I'm going to take Jackson. Oh, you Kane. also have Kyle Burnlord to choose from. And Kyle Burnlord, I apologize. I There's, yeah, you got three there. guys to choose from. You're I like I like Burnlord and Scannoni, but I'm going to go with Ken Cannon. Okay. Because Ken Cannon now for the Atlas, and for me, you look at the format of sixes, and you got to make a lot of saves. <laughs> you, <laughs> you do. Know? You're you right. Are, Peppered with shots, and I don't know where he fits in terms of the, the different goalies in this league, but it feels like Jack and Cannon has seen more shots than any. He like I feel like there's games where he has 17, 18 saves, you know, con consistently over the course of the, the iteration of the PLL. So to me, he could be a good guy because it feels like he can get saves and saves in bunches, and I think that's really important for this format. And that, to me, that really sets it apart because he's a guy that has seen a lot of shots, yeah. he can take a lot of shots, and he can handle that and make the saves to go with that. So I'm going to go with Kincannon there. Not I that like, the other guys don't have a lot of no. saves. It just feels like he's had some big save numbers. He's had some big games of big save numbers where the up and down format, you know, in the in, when the games have been a little bit more high pace, have suited him a little bit better in trying to make a lot of saves. Yeah, I, I like that pick. I, he's also jacked. Yeah, he's an athlete, big, man. Big, like, yeah, he is strong. Yeah. yeah, he's absolutely ripped. Yes. Um. So. Uh, so yeah, I like that pick. All right. So recap. Uh, for my sixes team, I've got Courier Teat. Blaze Reardon, Danny Logan, Mike Manley to kind of break down my defense, and then Logan Wisnowskis. And you got what? I have – sorry, I'm going to write – I didn't write it down, the last one. Um, I got Tom Schreiber, Lyle Thompson, Graham Hasek, Ryan Tarafenko, Justin Anderson, and then Jack Concannon. So All right. let us know who you think is better. Dylan, our producer today. Dylan, who do you whose team do you like better? Yeah, let's see. We're going to get Dylan's Tell us reaction. Tell in our ears. Who you got? Who, who you guys he, got in the back? Uh, Dylan, pick. Bailey, Mc Oh, so Dylan is disappointed that you picked all lefties. <laughs> this guy's play with two hands, guys. You know, we, we, we play with two hands in, in the outdoor the, game. The, the field's going to be tilted. Everybody's yeah, going to be over fine. on one side. That's Don't okay. Worry about it. You know, you can work some guys in. You know, if you want to pick a sub, you can later on after the program. Well, you know, it's all right. I, I feel I still feel very good about my team. All right. We're not talking box game. We're talking field game. Maybe, you know, the PLL and if Paul Rabel's watching, maybe they'll draft some of these teams up and they'll actually put them out there. The Tom and Travis game. Yeah, you let us know. We'll, we'll throw this out on social media. You let us know what you, yeah. what you think of our teams. And uh, if you want to pick a team of PLL All-Stars, who would be your sixes team? Go for yeah, it. Yeah, and if you have access to the NFT, I think for us, if we did, that'd be a conflict of interest. But if you, and you want to insert this as a suggestion, that by all means. Just play a quarter of six. Yeah, I don't know if that's yeah. on the table, but I think that that would be a fun idea. That would so be a this fun is idea. our contribution to that. <laughs> and and they will have they will have a sixes tournament uh, coming up uh, here next year. Yeah, well, we talked about it. I think it was the end of the last program yeah. where I, I went on about the Super Cups right. and the yeah. Cups and relegation. That's what the PLL is doing. And, so and they, all of that. We'll yeah. see a version of this. We won't get you if you want to go listen to that. By all means. Anyway, we thank you for sticking <laughs> with us through all of that because we've got good stuff still coming. We had a chance to catch up with the new head coach from St. John's, working uh, at St. John's now after being an assistant at Michigan. Justin Turry joins us now. So we now welcome in the new head coach at St. John's, Justin Turry. Justin, congratulations. What about this program and what about this job made it the right one for you? Uh, well, thank you for having me, guys, uh, number one. And uh, there, are, there are a whole lot of answers to that question. Um, I think in the end, you, you leave a place, you have a feeling. Um, I know that's happened every time I've been on campus at, at somewhere I ended up calling home. And uh, the process happened pretty quickly. Um, and once I was on campus and got to sit down and meet with Mike Craig and, and Kathy Meehan and um, all the people that are at St. John's, it became obvious that this is a place that's really about their people, that, that they're, they're the, the, the lifeblood of what this athletic department runs on. And it, uh, it was really in line with a lot of, of what I've experienced over my career and what I was looking for. Um, so it made it pretty easy to walk away um, with a place that feels like home, that's a little bit close to home too, which always helps and, and being in the heart of, of Long Island and a really vibrant lacrosse area. But uh, a lot of things came together, and it, and it just felt right. Yeah, interesting, you know, coming from a place like Michigan, where I feel like the culture, even beyond lacrosse, you know, the sports vibe there and the mindset of a lot of the individuals on that campus is just kind of different. What part of that, I mean, for you, what was that experience like, and what can you bring to St. John's from that experience of being in a place like Michigan? Yeah, the athletic department in Michigan is, uh, and certainly a lot, of it, a lot of it is driven by football, but we're fortunate to have, uh, every resource at our fingertips to be great 
Um, it's a it's a university that cares so much about their athletics, both from an academic side and, and an athletic side, and just the surrounding community. And I think from that, and and when I thought about St. John's and growing up as a kid on Long Island, you. St. John's and St. John's like basketball was, it was it. I mean, I remember watching Ron Artest and LeVar Postel and St. John's was just, that was like New York's team. You knew what St. John's university was. You knew what their athletics represented and not just basketball, but across the board and, and all of our Olympic sports. I mean, you look at soccer, you look at baseball and the success and the historical success that they've had. And it was just part of the community and, and part of the area. Um, and everybody here, and what was really obvious to me is how much St. John's, not only the athletic department, but how much the school means to them and how much passion and pride they take in wearing the, the CJ on their chest. You obviously mentioned the basketball program that's part of the Big East, and I think of this program with lacrosse, and, and you're in a conference that obviously Denver has had its run. Georgetown obviously has, has really come on here in the last couple of years. But it feels like you can jump into a program. We're talking about Bobby Benson, who's now there at Providence. You can jump into a program, make an impact with, with a couple of good recruiting classes, and feel like you can compete in a good conference. Like, What do you look at when you see the Big East and the opportunity to compete here? I think the level of competition, number one, from um, what I was fortunate to be a part of as a player and now as a coach, uh, the Big East top to bottom, uh, you're playing the best programs in the country. And you get to say that year in and year out, a multiple big uh, tournament uh, team, uh, former national champions, number one teams in the country in Georgetown and Denver. I mean, you look up and down Marquette, Villanova, Providence, uh, the success that all these programs have had and are capable of having. It's a competitive environment and, and it's one you want to be a part of. Um, and we know where we are now. I, I'm, there's no... Uh, we're not going to promise anything. We understand there's a lot of work to be done and, and, a, and a build that needs to take place. But everything here at St. John's um, is, is in place to do that. Um, and really excited about who we have in, in place on the roster and the support of the entire athletic department and the administration. And I just look at this conference as, as a great opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity to compete right away. Um, it's an opportunity to, to cut your teeth and go up against the best and um, it's going to be a, a really fun challenge that I think everyone, uh, everyone that's in the department here on the team now and everyone that we're talking to and hoping to bring in is ready to take on. After some different experiences with some different programs, this your first head coaching job. What does a Justin Turry program look like? Well, I think in what I have always thought in my past experiences and, and Certainly growing up in West Islip, it was a very prideful community and um, going to a place like Duke and playing for a coach like Coach Janowski, working under coaches like Joe Barici and, and Kevin Connery. Um, people first, second and third are, are what make up a program and what really define who you are. So we're going to be really people driven. Uh, we're going to be very um, selective in, in who we bring in to make sure they're uh, people that fit St. John's University and, and that fit um, what we are going to build and how we're going to do it. Um, I think from a pure lacrosse perspective, it's tough to say exactly how you want to play until you really evaluate and see your roster. But um, traditionally, I've, I've played a full field style lacrosse, and, and I can see that continuing both in the way I, uh, way I was taught and the way we have coached it over the past couple of years at a couple stops. I think it'll be a fun brand of lacrosse where – uh, we're going to teach the fundamentals at the most basic level and give our players a, a great opportunity to go out and be lacrosse players um, and make plays and make mistakes and kind of coach them along the way through that, um, but provide a really, a really basic structure and framework for them to, uh, to, to play this game, I think, the way that they all love to play and the way it should be played. Uh, along those lines, you mentioned some of the places you've been. Like, you've got stops at Harvard and Army and, and Michigan, which, like, in terms of the the players you're recruiting, they're all kind of different. So, and St. John's is another different stop. Like, what do you, how, what's your vision in terms of selling the program, and how do these other stops, especially the recruiting side of it and being part of that, help you in now trying to sell this program? You know, I think the university and the program does sell itself to a degree. And, and the, the way I've been looking at it, and I, I don't want to use the word sleeping giant, but from a lacrosse perspective, 
St. John's is a pretty nationally, globally recognized brand. The athletic department is pretty nationally recognized. But in the lacrosse world, we're just, I don't know if we're just not there yet, or we just got to get more people to, to see what we have. Um, I think that goes a long way. And the school itself, I mean, uh, it, it's a gorgeous campus. Uh, we have the, the city at our fingertips and a, a large alumni base, most of which live right in the tri-state area, right at our fingertips as well. So it's connecting our guys to that and, and showing them the opportunities there. It's showing the opportunities to compete in the Big East uh, against the best of the best. And at, at all those stops, although different, uh, I would say uh, what we always had recruited and what we will continue to recruit at St. John's are um, our players and young men that want to um, are, are looking for holistic excellence, right? Excellence uh, in the classroom, excellence in their life off the field and excellence on the field and, and guys that are driven to that, that want to work towards that. Uh, and, and in the end, just um, have an absolute passion and love for the game uh, that they're going to put in the necessary work to get to where they want to. Uh, you played for Sean Quirk, correct? At, and the Cannons? That is correct. <laughs> so now, you'll be, Cannons. now you're going to be coaching Caden, a uh, young goalie is going to be a sophomore. Have you talked to Sean you know, about that <laughs> dynamic? You know, what, a kind of a weird little generation thing going on there, right? Yeah, we stayed away from that dynamic. I think he's a, he's, he's a coach in one respect, but a dad in the other. So he, he gets that and the separation uh, there. But, uh, I mean, Caden won amongst, I think, a, a great core of returners that we have coming back. Um, a lot of younger guys that got time early, which is going to prove really valuable. I look at guys like him and Brian Kelly and Braden Pratt, who all played significantly as freshmen uh, in major roles and were kind of thrown to the fire. But, uh, but yeah, Coach Park texted me, texted me more out of a player coach relationship out of excitement, I think, than anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a funny connection. It's amazing, especially at this level. The mm. lacrosse world is very small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I think it's really cool from watching kind of your generation of professional players who played in the MLL, a little bit in the PLL. And now you have all these, all you guys are getting head coaching jobs. What about, but a lot of them, like you look at John Galloway, a guy who played even as he took that, that over at, down in Jacksonville. What is it about this generation? Because it feels like there have been guys in the past, but you guys were some of the first to really continue to play professionally while you're still moving up the ranks in the, in the college coaching world. I think we were all fortunate, and I can speak, I mean, for John and myself, we were playing together on the Rattlers, and actually my first job was the volunteer at Providence under Chris Gabrielli, and John and I lived together in his apartment. <laughs> and after practice, I would go out and shoot on him for an hour, and it was the best training you could possibly ask for <laughs> for both of us. Um, but we've been really fortunate, I think, number one, for the opportunity to really continue our playing career and, and have an elongated playing career afterwards. And with that, you learn from so many different people and players and guys that have gone through different programs at the highest level and guys who are really committed to what they do uh, and, and to also be coaching at the same time and have uh, former bosses that were really excited about the prospect that you were continuing your playing career, saw the value in it. And um, the amount of stuff that I learned from those guys from a coaching perspective uh, has seriously helped me down the line to become a better coach uh, myself. And it's cool to see everybody. I mean, I had a really easy decision for me when we had our firstborn to retire then <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a couple of years ago. Um, but to see everybody, and I, I admire John and Connor for continuing to do it while, while they were making the transition to a head coach, but now to see all of us um, who were peers and playing against each other for so long, now be peers uh, and coaching and leading, I think, different programs in everybody's own style and own way. But to see how, I mean, I can, I can just see the things that John does with his program down in Jacksonville um, and the way he led us as a captain with the Rattlers and, and how Connor plays and how that has translated and rub off, rubbed off to his guys at Cornell uh, and then there, there's so many other examples, and I'm sure there will be more, but it's really cool to see that connection. From someone that's been so close to those guys and seen them, can you, you like you said with Connor, you can kind of see some of what their characteristics were as players coming out in their, in their guys too, right? That's got to be kind of interesting. Yeah, from, from knowing them on that playing level, you number one, you understand why they're so great at what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, yeah, you see how that rubs off. You see how... Uh, I, I actually watched a video, I think, last week of, of a goalie that 
train that from Ponte Vedra, Jacksonville, Florida, and he played like John. And I just <laughs> shot him like, "Hey, do you train this kid?" So, yeah, of course, he's one of our guys. <laughs> um, but just watching some of the guys and and on their teams, and those guys are just two examples. But um, but but it's, it's cool to see that rub off. Mm -hmm. Uh, from somebody who's a part of an industry that you kind of work all over and you go where the job is, but you always, at some point, you feel like you want to get to home. And I know that's uh, true for me, and I haven't gotten a chance to do it yet. So I have to, that's why I kind of set this question up for you. How cool is it to, after the different stops you've been on, now have a chance to get a head coaching job that's close to home? Um, it, it definitely does mean a lot, I think, because of the community the lacrosse, the greater lacrosse community in our area, in Long Island, in the tri-state, uh, how much the sport means and, and is a part of so many communities. Uh, it, it's, it's cool to come back and to reconnect with a lot of people and um, the amount of text exchange and calls and from coaches and teammates and opponents at every level that are just connected to some degree has, has been really cool. And, and it, it was a really Michigan was a tough place to leave um, and, and it took certainly the really the right opportunity and, um, and in our game there are only so many so many of those opportunities and to have it be close to home, uh, be around family, be at a place that you know so well, uh, it, it, it just it was icing on the cake and, and it makes you really excited about about what we can build and, and what's ahead of us. Like you said, when we came on here before, we said things have been busy, you know, for the, obviously since you took the job and you're someone who knows that with what, three kids under two, Justin? I, I mean, well, how would you describe that life outside of all of this? <laughs> As you guys know, coaches' wives are uh, a special breed in and of their own. My wife is a saint, and she handles it all with grace. I figured, why not? To, we just had twins two months ago. Why not just throw all the change at it at once and <laughs> see, see where we end up in a year or two, and maybe it'll come down then. But, uh, but no, it's um, it's... She's been so unbelievably supportive. She knows this has kind of been the, the goal uh, to, to lead a program. Um, she's, she's certainly really happy to have friends and family around and support uh, with the three little monster hammerheads running <laughs> around. And gosh, only knows what the next couple of years are going to be like. <laughs> but, uh, but it's been crazy and hectic and probably a lot of which I've, I've asked for and expected. But uh, she's... She she does it all. Uh, I, I wouldn't be anywhere without her support and everything that, that she's uh, she's given to me. Uh, embrace the chaos, Justin. Yeah, uh, exactly. That, that's the only way you get through it. Well, hey, congratulations again on the new job. Good luck with everything, and uh, we'll catch up some here sometime here down the road. So great uh, to hear from Justin Turi. Thanks to him for taking some time. Really cool to see him closer to his hometown now. Yeah, that's really nice. Yeah. Former PLL guy himself. For sure. So he's got all that experience. That'll yes. do it for today's show. So thank you for joining us once again. We had a lot of fun today, didn't we? Uh, we did. This was this was great. Yeah. Summer shows. <laughs> uh, coming up next week, Tom's on vacation, but I'll be joined hopefully by a special guest and head coach of the U21 team for Team USA, Nick Myers, also the Ohio State coach. He joins me for a conversation, get ready for the U21 World Championships in Ireland. So make sure you stick tuned. stay tuned for that. But for now, he's Tom. I'm Travis. We'll see you.